So to be honest with you, this is a, uh, a really difficult gospel for me to preach on. Um, it's not that it's bad advice. It's actually very appropriate advice. You should absolutely address a problem with as few people as necessary before bringing other people in. So you should only involve the entire church or the entire community uh, as a last resort. Because once things have gotten to that point, this isn't going to work out well for anybody, in all likelihood. And uh, that not only is just good general advice, but good organizations do exactly that. You know, the Catholic Church takes this reading seriously. The Archbishop, representing the entire church, does not weigh in on local parish matters unless he absolutely has to. So if you complain to Archbishop Listecki about anything here in West Bend, his first question will always be the same. Have you talked to Father Nathan about that? Uh, if you like, you can also consider the United States justice system. On the state level, here in Wisconsin, we have the Wisconsin Municipal Court, and then the Circuit Court, then the Court of Appeals, and then the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And as far as I understand, you can't really skip a step. You have to work up to the Supreme Court if your case is in fact that strong. So, you know, there is definitely merit in this gospel. It can be practical, no problem there. My frustration with this gospel is I've seen and witnessed conflict mediation fail on all three levels described in the gospel, one-on-one, -on -one, small group or two or three witnesses, and the entire community. You know, that first one, obvious. Of course I have failed to get someone to understand something through one-on-one -on -one conversation. We all have. Who here has never failed to win an argument with another person? Obvious enough. The other two may not be so obvious to you, though. So, um, as a matter of fact, I had to deal with some pretty rough social conflict back in college. And to give you just a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a background, I belonged to a special interest house in college. I was, I was part of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Appreciation Club. Shocker, I know. <laughs> and the club was huge. I mean, it was huge. And it was not a very big college. We were so large that we had our own housing. So 30 or so of the most deserving members were able to live there instead of in general housing. And you were free to apply uh, beginning your sophomore year. So wouldn't you know it, you know, one day one of the guys was being a little loopy. One of the guys living in the house, you know, it was an internal matter. And we did exactly what we just read about in the gospel. Three of us got together and we went and we confronted him at his room about the problem at hand because one-on-one -on -one conversation was not working. And the guy was livid that we did that. He was furious with us for cornering him and putting him in a position where he was in a weaker place to defend himself. That's a shame, but it's understandable. It's understandable that someone could react that way. And this was a relatively minor thing, albeit the problem wasn't solved that day. We got through it. But that same club also failed with that ultimate level of conflict mediation where you involve the entire community. Um, you know, <laughs> gamers, geeks, assorted misfits and social pariahs, you know, my people, <laughs> it's where I come from, it's where I belong, we're, we're not the most emotionally stable people in the world. <laughs> the drama flows freely among us, it is true, and it will in all likelihood remain true for quite some time. One time, a, uh, a creeping social problem just hit a breaking point, and it was a problem that had been growing for months, if not years. A very small minority of the club had grown dissatisfied with the governing body of this club. And they complained in a number of ways, both one-on-one -on -one conversation in small groups, um, but they never got their way because what they wanted was utterly ridiculous. Like, they were asking for the impossible even if they didn't realize that. No one could actually realistically please them. So, near-ish the end of the school year, they made a formal accusation 
accusing the entire governing body of elitism, corruption, and incompetence. Before I go on with the story, allow me to be perfectly clear. These charges were completely blown out of proportion. This was not a search for justice. This was a college-style temper tantrum. So even though everyone was, knew it was baloney, bylaws are bylaws, and they knew the rules, what they did was perfectly legal. And so everybody had to cram into the basement lounge, which did not fit that many people, and we had to have an emergency general meeting. And the six members of the executive council had to get up and defend their integrity and judgment before the entire club. And by the way, that year I happened to be treasurer. So I was, I was third on the chain of command. I was on the chopping block. And uh, one by one, it was put to a vote where a two-thirds majority vote would expel that person from their position for the rest of the school year. Uh, so don't worry about me, by the way. The vote to keep me in as treasurer was 100%. I got the unanimous vote. Not even the original instigators voted against me. It's pretty cool, actually. I don't think that will ever happen again in my life, to get 100% of the vote. That just doesn't happen. Um, but sadly, two people out of the six voluntarily stepped down from their position before the vote because they were so grievously offended. They were so hurt that things got that out of hand over such minor issues, they just walked away. And that club never recovered from that night. From that night on, we fractured into a number of splinter groups, maybe about a dozen, and they didn't speak to one another unless absolutely necessary. And it stayed that way until everybody, including the freshmen, graduated college and the club had perfectly new members with a blank slate. That was the only solution for the, for the club. And I won't lie to you, that was so pointlessly and needlessly painful that still impacts my behavior today, albeit in a minor way. We're talking about an old memory after all. So all of that history is being summarized for me every time I hear this gospel. And by the way, the Bible is supposed to do that. The Bible is absolutely supposed to do that. It is supposed to fit your life. You are supposed to have a personal relationship with these instructions and lessons. And we all have that in common. I mean, imagine how, uh, there aren't that many of us here at Mass today, uh, at least here at six. Imagine how long we'd be here if everybody got a turn to share a story about how conflict mediation succeeded or failed in your life. The church ain't that full tonight, but we'd be here all night. I'm confident of that. The gospel unites us in that way. All of us have at least a passing understanding of what Jesus was talking about that day to his disciples. So that covers everything except the frustration I mentioned at the very beginning of the homily. Conflict is painful, and this gospel does not guarantee success. Things can break down even if you have good technique. Why is that? Why isn't suitable conflict mediation enough? The answer is that it's because there is a spiritual component at work as well. If you read this gospel as a short self-help book with no spiritual component, well, then it is, it is reasonable advice, but if you take it, things may very well break down anyway, like in my club at college, even if you take appropriate steps. The spiritual component is simply the understanding <laughs> that there are some things more important than your personal beef with someone else. Cultivating a healthy community is more important than any of that put together. It would seem that there are plenty of instigators operating in the world, people who hem and haw until they get their way, and they don't seem terribly concerned about how much collateral damage they're responsible for in the meantime. But brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, 
The people who make a community great are not the people who have to get their way every time, nor are they the people who don't stand for anything or ever defend themselves. The people who make a church or a community great are the people who possess that idea of solidarity, the people who understand in their hearts that they're a part of something bigger than them. That is wisdom by any other name. And if we have that, if we have the spiritual component and the practical advice together, then and only then will this gospel be effective, healthy, and truly just.